I'm delighted to be here with you as always. My name is Mentor Ate and in today's session and in the next few minutes, I'm going to be talking to you about what I think is a great concept to achieving a, a really remarkable life. I'm going to be talking about your self-image, but more importantly, I'm going to be talking about what I consider to be um, a much more encompassing um, view of what it takes to understand yourself, your self-portrait. And in today's session, we're going to be talking about probably about four or five different key areas of your self-portrait. We're going to talk about the importance of self-talk. We're going to talk about self-confidence. We're going to talk about your self-image. We're going to talk about your self-worth and then your self-identity. Um, now, I've found from my life's experience, but also um, communicating and working with people and studying the lives of other people, I've come to the understanding that one of the limiting factors we have is the picture we have about ourselves. We unfortunately are limited in many cases, not by external events, not by circumstances, but more so by the picture we have about ourselves. Let me start today's session with an opening statement. I think that might set the scene of what we're going to be talking about today. And the statement is this, that you can never outperform your self-image. You can never outperform your self-identity. In other words, you're always going to be limited by the person you believe you are. Now, each and every one of us has a need to belong, to feel as though we're part of something bigger. And that's where the self-identity comes in. Our self-image, on the other hand, is that picture we have, maybe formulated by a number of um, life experiences, events and relationships and results we've had in life. And in combination with the self-identity and the self-image, Fortunately for, for a few, and unfortunately for a lot, our outcomes and our results in life vary. And let's start with your self-image. If you travel to Africa, if you travel to perhaps parts of Africa where you have wildlife, you have uh, the elephants and you can see how they're being domesticated and trained, for commercial purposes. One of the first things you observe is, at the very young age, a baby elephant um, is still very weak. And the care of the elephant takes the baby elephant and ties a chain around its, perhaps, legs and puts it to a stake, pins that stake into the ground so firmly and so strongly to keep the baby elephant fixed in that position. Now. The baby elephant is still at a very young age and it hasn't quite mastered and developed its strength. And so the baby elephant will pull and pull and pull. But after a few minutes, it gives up because it realizes this chain and this stake is more powerful than I am. And it succumbs to this position and place that has found itself. That is not the end of the story. Because what I find really fascinating, but also very sad, is this same procedure is repeated every day. And although the baby elephant starts to grow in strength, in size and capacity, what you find is that the baby elephant has now been conditioned a number of times after trying to break out, it accepts reality as I cannot break away from this chain. I have to stay fixed. Now, even when that baby elephant grows up to a stage and an age where it can pull down maybe a 10 story building, um, even when it grows to a stage where all it has to do is just walk to break that chain, the baby elephant will remain in that same position. Rather, the, the baby elephant that is now an older elephant will remain in the same position. That doesn't mean the baby elephant or the elephant has a self-image, no. Um, human beings are unique. 
unlike uh, any form of the animal kingdom, we have something different. We have what we call a mind, and we have speech. I'll talk about both later on in today's session, but here is the point. At the young age, the baby elephant is conditioned on what it can do and what it cannot do. And even though its external environment changes, and even though its internal capacity and strength, power, size increases, the baby elephant has a conditioned mind, if you want to use that word. It has a, a set image of what it can do. Now, what I find remarkable is the baby elephant, when it's grown into a normal, big, strong elephant, if you pin the same large elephant to a stake with a chain in the ground, that elephant will remain in that position and will die of hunger. Now think about this and think about how it relates to you and I. Unfortunately, we are not chained. We're not put on a stake and pinned to the ground. Um, but in various ways, our experiences of life is somewhat similar to what the baby elephant has to go through. Um, there are some factors that affect who we become and who we are. Our experiences of the past, the events we've encountered as we journey through life, our relationships, our associations, our dreams of the future, all of those individually form and affect and influence how we see ourselves. So, the first question I want to ask you is what image do you have about yourself? Now that's a, a very, I found a very challenging question because most people would say, I have a good image about myself. Now I'm not talking about the image you see reflected when you stand in front of a mirror. Um, in the 1960s, Dr. Maxwell Maltz was a unique, very experienced plastic surgeon. And he postulated after a number of years of working with patients, um, he realized something quite interesting, but also very sad. He found that whenever he had patients who came for cosmetic surgery, some of them had scars, some of them perhaps didn't like parts of their body they wanted changed, that there were two groups of people. The first group of people were those who, after every surgical operation, they felt better about themselves. Um, the second group were those who, even though the operation was successful, even though the scars were removed, even though they looked beautiful, he found they still saw themselves with the same image that they had before the operation. So he came to a conclusion that every one of us has two images. The image we see when we stand in front of a full-length mirror, your reflection. But you also have an internal image. What controls you is your internal image. Now, Dr. Maxwell Morse was so fascinated with that study that he decided to leave the surgical world and you know, stop becoming, stop, you know, stop practicing as a surgeon. And he started working as a psychologist because he realized that he had spent a long time working on improving the external appearance, but the problem lied in the internal picture. So he decided to go into psychology and help people break and change that image. Now he wrote a fascinating book called Psycho-Cybernetics. Interesting book. But here is the point. You and I have a self-image. We have to accept that. We have a self-image. It's not a matter of maybe or I don't think I have one. You all have, we all have a self-image. And our self-image is what controls the level of our success. It controls the level of our performance. It controls the level of our interaction with people. But even it controls and it dictates how we see ourselves. Now, if that's the case, the question we should ask ourselves is, but how do I have a great self-image and how do I change? my self-image if perhaps you're not happy with what you have. Let me take you a step back and start by making a statement. 
No one is born with a self-image. Now that sounds very strange, but I want you to hear me out. None of us is born with a preformed self-image. We all come into the world um, in principle like a, a blank canvas. We're empty, there is nothing. And every day we have to paint a portrait of who we think and who we believe we are. At the young age, one of the challenges you have, and I had, and every young person will have, is that we have not developed what we call our reasoning faculty. Now, to understand that, you've got to understand how the mind is designed and how the mind functions. We have five senses. We have six higher faculties in the mind. Our five senses deal with touch, taste, smell, sound, and sight. Your ability to see, your ability to hear, your ability to use your palates to taste, your ability to touch something and know that it's hot or it's cold. All of those five senses control how you interact with your internal world and your external world. Now, unfortunately, the education system has focus more on using our five senses. When you are young, you're taught how to read and write. You start learning about sounds. You start learning about various tastes. Very few people are taught about the six higher faculties. Imagination, intuition, perception, reason, memory, and will. Now your six higher faculties is where all greatness lies. It's where all success begins. It's where happiness can be found. It's where the good life, prosperity, good fortune, good health can be found. In other words, if you want to change your self-image, you've got to learn how to use your six higher faculties because your natural senses, using sight as a good example, will show you things as they are. Now, if I look around, I can see various objects where I am now. If you're watching me, you're using a device to watch me now. You're observing by sight. When you use your eyes, we call that sight. But if you go beyond your sight and use your imagination, we call that using your vision. If you want to change your self-image, you've got to use your six higher faculties. Now, one of those higher faculties is reason. Reason deals with your ability to think, to think inductively and to think deductively to be able to distinguish between what's right and what's wrong at the young age you haven't developed that faculty and you cannot reason you cannot reason and choose and so here is something quite interesting the ancient writer says train up a child in the way that he or she should go and when they grow You'll never depart from it. So the question is, who is training you? And what have you been taught about yourself? Now, having this limitation of not being able to use your reasoning faculty means at the young age, all of the information you receive flows into your mind and you cannot distinguish between what's right. You cannot be selective. So you accept everything that comes to you by sight, by sound, by association. So, for many of us, including myself, my self-image up until a number of years ago was based on a foundation built by other people's opinions about me. And listen very carefully, because this is important. This meant that my father, my mother, my family, my friends, the environment I was raised in, all played an instrumental role in shaping and forming my self-image. But in addition to that, my experiences, good, bad, or indifferent, the events in my life, great or tragic, the people that I interacted with, positive or negative, affected 
how I saw myself. Now, even more important were the dreams and the goals I had. Now, I was raised by two great parents, a great father and a great mother, incredible parents. Financially, we struggled. Um, spiritually, we were wealthy. So there was a contrast in difference between having an attitude of gratitude, an attitude of love, an attitude of forgiveness, benevolence, which we had, and understanding the value of material wealth that we lacked. So my self-image in various areas of my life were formed based on what I was able to see and observe. When it came to having good attitude and having a good philosophy, we had that. When it came to perhaps money, I always thought that poor people didn't deserve money. So my self-image when it came to material wealth for a long time was based on a principle and based on a set of false philosophies about the poor. I heard things such as, well, there's so many poor people in the world like me. And that's because there's a God in the sky somewhere who loves poor people. Now you and I have to agree that's a very flawed philosophy. But that was my self-image. When it came to material wealth, I always saw myself as poor. So although my external circumstances started getting better at an older age, I had an image of myself. And so whenever I had money, I did everything that I could do to get rid of it. Why? Subconsciously, money was the root of all evil because that's what I learned growing up. And so, who in his right senses would want money in their lives? So whenever I had it, subconsciously I had to get rid of it. So I remained in debt for a number of years. Now, I'm using that as an example to illustrate something. Your self-image up until you get to the point where you can start to reason, it's formed and given to you. You inherit it. Your responsibility, however, is as soon as you're able to now think for yourself, you have to start asking intelligent questions. One of the most important questions you have to ask yourself is this. Is this who I want to be? If the answer is yes, that's beautiful. You just improve on who you are. But if the answer is no, then change it. Now, what I had to do in my case was I had to sit down and ask myself the question, who do I want to be? If I had to live this life all over again, if I had a blank canvas, who would I want to be? Now, that question started the journey towards changing my self-image. You have to ask yourself the same question. In many cases, this will require pulling down the foundations of your life. So for example, in my life I had a, a foundation, which is my self-image. And based on that foundation, I built various buildings, building blocks. Happiness, relationship, business, finance, um, health. But I had various building blocks of areas and components of my life, all built on my self-image. I had to pull down those building blocks and start rebuilding a new building block based on how I wanted to live. And that is what you might have to do, I'm not suggesting that you should. And here is the point. You cannot get rid of an old habit by tinkering with the habit and by trying to fix various parts of it. The best way to get rid of an old habit is to create a new habit that displaces the old habit. So, my first question to you is this. Are you happy with the image you have about yourself? Now, before you answer that question, I want to ask you a second follow-up question. Very few people would say no to that question, first question. Most people would say, yes, I'm happy with who I am. And obviously, I'm not a judge. I don't intend to be. A part of the reason for that is because we tend to defend our beliefs. In a way, accepting that your self-image needs to be improved, for some people, is an attack on their identity and their self-belief. So here is the second follow-up question to you. And I want you to think about the second question carefully before you answer it. 
The second question is this. If you were to look at the results in all areas of your life, health, financial prosperity, wealth, happiness, joy, love, relationships, business, education, look at the results you're getting in each area and answer the question, are you happy with the results you're getting? And the reason I ask this question is simply because the results in all areas of your life is set by your self-image. It limits your performance. So if you're not happy with your results, then you don't try to change something on the outside. You have to change something within. And what you change is the portrait, is the picture, is the image you have about yourself. And as soon as you raise your level of self-image or you improve your self-image, what you find is simultaneously your results improve. To attempt to change your external results without changing yourself and your self-image is a struggle against life. You might get temporary results, but in a short while you've gone back to where you've always been. So the, the beginning point of changing your life begins by sitting down and asking yourself a simple question. If I had to live this life again, how would I want to live? And then use that script to start painting a new portrait of yourself. Paint a new self-image, one filled with positive um, self-talk and positive ideas and one filled with great um, pictures of your future and dreams of a better experience. One designed for you, not based on what you inherited from those who loved you. Now remember this, I'm not suggesting in any way that the influence you have by association from family and friends are necessarily wrong every time. Now, what I'm suggesting is people can only give you what they have. My parents could only give me what they had. For that reason, I love them very much. But one thing you must ask yourself when you get of age and you're able to reason for yourself is the question. What they gave me, is that what I want? And is that what I need? If the answer is no, you can always start to change your life. And it begins simply one decision at a time. Now, I've talked about self-image a little bit. I want to talk about self-identity and how you can start to change your self-identity to create the results that you want. It's a simple process. It's a very unique procedure. It doesn't require meditation and um, affirmations. It just requires understanding. That's all it requires. We all have an identity. Our identity is often built on a belief. Our belief is formed and fashioned by our self-image. So you can see the three of them are connected. Self-belief, self-image, self-identity. You've got to understand how each plays a role in your life. Now, to change your self-identity, you have to start by collecting what I call empowering evidence of your ability. Um, give you a good example. Let's say, for example, you're the kind of person who perhaps is uh, not outspoken and you see yourself as someone who is shy and not outspoken. And so the, the, the thought or the idea of you standing in front of a hundred people and giving a speech is out of the question. That is not you. You might say, well, I'm not the kind of person who does I, you know, things like that. You know, my father said I'm not good as a speaker. That's your identity. That's how you've identified yourself. Now, how do you change that? There are two ways you can change it. You see, the mind is such a powerful instrument that we have. The mind cannot distinguish between what's real and what's imagined. And this is where your higher faculty comes in, imagination. The 
The starting point is about how you get results. Self-confidence comes from results. However, those results don't have to be results that have been um, achieved in reality. Now, this might seem a little bit confusing. So let me explain what I mean by that. Imagination creates reality. Everything you see around you is not the real thing. It's the product of the idea in someone's mind. The reality is the imaginative act, the imaginative thought. So for example, if an artist produces a song, a lyrics to a song, the reality, the original music is in the artist's mind. What you see in written form is a reflection of that original idea. So everything you see around you was once imagined. In other words, imagination creates reality. Now you can say, I need to practice every day by um, learning how to talk to people. And you can do that and that would help you build some self-confidence where you're gathering evidence of your ability to speak in front of a crowd. That can take you 10 years before you break the spell or before you have enough performances to raise your confidence. Now, the second way you can do that is by using your imagination. You create a vision in your mind. You go into your mind's eye and you see yourself standing in front of people and you're delivering a great speech. You get emotionally involved with the experience. Now, all of this is happening in your mind. And here is the key. Feeling is the secret. You allow yourself to feel all the emotions. You allow yourself to use your sensory faculties in your imagination. So you see yourself standing there. You see yourself perhaps wearing a dress. You see yourself interacting with the crowd. You're living in the feeling of the wish fulfilled. That's the key. You have to learn to live in the feeling. Now, if you do this once, say you do a, a session of 10, 15 minutes in your mind, as you do that, it's no different. If you really emotionalize the experience, it's no different than if you were standing in reality in front of 50 people. Now, when you've done that the first time and done it the second time, what you find is that your confidence is starting to increase. You haven't done it in reality. You've done it in imagination. But imagination creates reality. Now, by creating the picture in your mind, that allows you to take action. So, the point is this. To begin to change your self-identity, you have to go into the future and get results in your mind in advance. Bring that picture of the future back into the present. Use that experience to allow you to take action. When you take action, what you find, if you do it just the way you've done it in your mind, you find that it happens and the experience is just as you envisioned it to be. Now you have tangible evidence. That evidence you have tangible now helps you form and strengthen your self-belief. Your self-belief reinforces your self-image. So now you now have a different picture of yourself. You once saw yourself as someone who could never speak on stage, could never speak to a group of people. However, by using your imagination and taking action, you now have one, one evidence of you speaking to people. That starts to form a new image you have about you. You do this again, and the more you reinforce this, the more you start to change and build a new identity about how you see yourself to the point where you now feel comfortable talking to people or talking to a group of people. Now that's how you change your self-identity. You begin 
by using your imagination to create your ideal image and making a somewhat firm decision to live in the feeling of your wish fulfilled. Now, your natural senses tell you, tells you everything is not true. But in your imagination, though it appears in your imagination, it will, if you persist and live in that feeling, your feelings will change your actions. Your actions, if repeated, will create habits. Your habits will decide your results. Your results decide your destiny. So that's how you change your self-identity. Now, whilst you're doing this, what I call a unique transformation process, you've got to come back to what I started the session with. We've talked about the mind partially, primarily the imagination. But there's another part of what we all have that I consider to be extremely powerful. Speech. Speech. I think mind and speech differs, or rather allows us to differ from all of the life forms. We have the ability to choose because we have a mind. We have the ability to choose because we have speech. Now speech comes in two forms. What you say internally. What you say externally. So here is a question to you. What are you saying to yourself every single day? day and every single hour of every day what are you saying internally what are you saying externally self-talk comes in very nicely now because self-talk is saying to yourself what you need to hear and what you would wish someone else would say to you self-talk is making a decision that you're not going to wait for others to affirm you, that you will speak highly of yourself. You will celebrate yourself. However, self-talk has to be learned. It's a learned habit. Um, it doesn't come naturally. It has to become um, a daily discipline that becomes a habit, that becomes a lifestyle. Now, why is self-talk important? Well, self-talk is important simply because thoughts are created. Um, internalized words or speech, um, we call that thought. When it stays inside you, it's a thought. When it comes out of you, it has to come out in written or spoken form. If you speak it, we say it's a word. If you write it, we say it's a word. So... Every single day, we have internal thoughts. Some of our thoughts are empowering. Some of our thoughts are disempowering. In other words, some are positive, some are negative. Now, we have to be selective. If you want to build a new self-image, if you want to live a, a much more fulfilled life, you have to control your thoughts. In other words, you have to choose the thoughts you allow to dwell within you and the words you allow to be expressed through you. Now here is the key. Your thoughts are creative. So if you have a poor self-image, I can guarantee, if you're aware that you have a poor self-image, I can guarantee that you are creating the future that you have. Because you're either reaffirming negatively true thoughts or true spoken words what you don't want in your future now some people are great at saying things such as i'm really lousy when it comes to dealing with numbers and they say it passionately and they believe it now they might have good ground for saying that they might be from experiences of the past it could be perhaps they were never good with maths but your words spoken your thoughts created within you, they don't go into your past. Your words and your thoughts go into your future. 
Your thoughts are creative every day, we're creating our future. You may not realize that you're creating your future, but you are. So, self-talk is simply a deliberate method that you discipline yourself to practice daily to correct whatever unconscious thoughts, spoken words, that you've created that perhaps you were unaware that you created. In other words, self-talk allows you to right your wrongs and it helps you to design the future by speaking, by speaking life into the future. So one of the things we all have to learn how to do is how to talk to ourselves. It's not something to be ashamed of. Sit down. Write a few words about yourself. You might say, I am beautiful, I am healthy, I am happy, I'm a loving person. You might say, I'm wealthy. Choose your words, choose what you want. You can say, I can do all things. You can say um, powerful words that make you feel good about yourself. Now here's the key. They can't just be words. They have to be emotionalized words. In other words, you've got to believe it. Now, I think perhaps this is the right place to bring in a concept that I think makes everything um, understandable. Um, two words are inscribed um, at a temple in Apollo, a Delphi. Know thyself. Know thyself. Um, I can talk about self-image, I can talk about self-concept, I can talk about self-portrait, I can talk about how to create self-confidence. But if you don't know yourself, if you don't know who you are, there's no way you can create a life that you really want to experience. So the, the starting point is knowing who you are. Self-talk is made easy if you know who you are. And I'm not talking about your name. I'm not talking about your possessions. I'm not talking about your professional degrees or your professional positions. I'm not talking about anything external. I found from experience that the more you connect your self-identity, your self-worth, your self-image with something external to you, the more you're going to have a really miserable life. And the reason is simple. Change is constant. So external circumstances will change. If your self-image is based on how your partner sees you, the fact that you're in a good relationship, the fact that you're in love, if they, for whatever reason, now I don't wish for this and I don't pray for this, but if for whatever reason that relationship ends, then it means that your self-worth falls down to the bare minimum. Everything external will change. You have to understand that. So, you must connect your self-image, your self-identity, your self-confidence, your self-worth, your self-portrait with something within you. But you have to know who that something is. And so, in today's session, I'm not going to talk about understanding the real you. But I'll say this, there are three parts to your personality and my personality. And there are three parts to the personalities of everyone who is alive today and everyone who has ever lived. There's the physical plane, there's the mental or psychological plane, there's the spiritual plane. In other words, I see myself not as a garment that I'm wearing. This is physical, this is a garment. When my journey is over, I let go of this garment and I continue to live. So this is physical. So I am not my body. You are not your body. So to build your self-image or self-identity based on how you look, I think it's a really tragic decision to make. I am a spirit. You are a spirit. 
We live in a body, we have a mind. Now understand that concept and understand the sequence. The highest level of who you are is spirit. Next to the spiritual level is the mental level. And finally, at the lowest level, is your physical level. Now on the physical plane, we express it in various ways. Good health, physical looks, prosperity, material wealth. In other words, you are not what you wear, you are not what you have, you are not what people say you are, you're a spirit. And the best part of you, the highest part of you, no one can see how perfect that part of you is. At the spiritual level, you and I are perfect. You cannot improve, not even by that little bit, you cannot improve your spiritual nature. You're perfect. The mind you have is there to help you achieve whatever you want on the physical plane. Your mind is one. There is only one mind. So you have access to unlimited potential. You just have to rearrange your mind, renew your mind, and create the right thoughts. So, self-talk is made perfect if you understand you if you understand who you are. And so here is my recommendation. Spend some time and study yourself. I can say with some level of certainty that everyone, with the exception of a few people that I've met, have a, a picture of who they are based on what people have said to them relationships, parents, friends, business colleagues, children, brothers and sisters, all of those words have formed their self-talk. You have to change that so it reflects who you really are, the image, the real true nature of who you are, which is spirit. And that spirit is perfect and that spirit is beautiful. So if you want to create a better self-image, recognize something. You're the highest level of creation. You're perfect. Now your body needs renewing. Your mind needs renewing. Your spirit is perfect. Now by starting with that understanding, you can start to form and choose words, self-talk words that are consistent with who you really are. Now don't just use words like I'm beautiful. When you say beautiful, it has to go beyond physical beauty. <laughs> You've got to see yourself, through your mind's eye, you've got to see yourself as a beautiful spirit, a perfect spirit. When you see, say to yourself, through self-talk, I'm wealthy, you've got to understand, it's not material wealth. You've got to start from the top. Spiritual wealth, you could say, I'm wealthy by, I have love and I express love. I'm grateful and I show gratitude and thankfulness. Um, I'm giving, I'm loving, so I'm always looking for people to help and to do good things for others. You might say, I'm living a purpose-driven life. I know why I'm here. I don't know why I was born. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. You've got to start from the top. So your self-talk conversations and written words all have to be um, holistic. It must contain the spiritual, the mental, and the physical part of who you are. Now, I hope that's been useful. I'm going to bring this into a, a close and bring it in for a landing by making a few final statements. And this is it. No one is born with a self-image. We come in empty. By choice, known or unknown, we can choose our self-image. But having said everything I said about the influence of your environment and your past and your experiences and your associations, there are no victims in life. You and I are volunteers. We get to choose. We get to play a part. We are the lowest common denominators in our respective lives. And so, the next five, ten years of your life doesn't have to be like the last five or ten years. Only if you choose to, 
by decision or indecision. So here is the point. If there's something you don't like about your life, if there's something you're not happy with, you can change it because you can choose. However, in changing and choosing a better future, always qualify it with a statement. Am I living on the lowest plane of who I am? Am I living on the higher plane of who I am? If your goal is simply to change the physical, if you're making your self-image and building that self-image based on the foundation of what you possess materially, what you look like physically, what people think of you physically, you're going to have a measurable life because people will change and people's expectations will change and wherever people have expectations of you they also have conditions that they want you to live by and if you keep trying to adapt your life and yourself to other people's expectations you do two things one you live a very miserable life because you don't live your true life and your true life's calling but number two whenever you choose to stop you disappoint them. And whenever you disappoint people, what tends to happen is you have a level of dissociation. People move away because you're not conforming to their expectations. And that creates pain. That pain reinforces a need for you to remain the way they want you to be. It's a downward spiral. It's a sad experience. So, I think the best place to start is to understand yourself, know thyself, take some time and study who you really are. Recognize that there is perfection in you, that perfection is in spirit, not physical. There is always going to be something about yourself that you would wish you could have improved. That is not a negative um, feeling. Growth and progress is something we're expected to um, be part of through our journey in life but recognizing that your spirit is perfect in every way gives you that strong foundation and makes you understand that this is all temporary this life is a short one but it continues beyond this life and therefore this gamut you have shouldn't be your focus now i hope that's been useful allow me to wish you the best of luck god bless